A lot of these are AI-based investments. Mm -hmm. For example, Xiaoyu is a product yes. that's basically a home robot. And a lot of colorful stuff. Yeah, this is a. Uh, this will in the future also have voice interface. It's a um, uh, levitating speaker. Isn't oh, that cool? It's, it's got a kind really of robot cool. look. Yeah. It doesn't really move yet. You can see Amazon Echo going into this kind of scenario, oh, right? And yeah. then this has a, uh, yeah. It's flying. There's not, nothing connected. It is. It is. And this one is really cute. Well, this what is, is a about? this is a toy. So it's a little toy that you can program. It's yeah. very good for teaching kids about AI. How to so you, how to do that? Uh, well, I, you can use a phone to uh, control it. Yeah. Tell teach you to play a song yeah. by after you. The new version of this can actually play basketball. It can throw throw balls, and you can program it to move forward throw a ball and you can have two robots play against each other. So all I need is this on the table? Uh, it could be life. anywhere. <laughs> well, it's more for kids, for kids to learn by AI, right? It's yeah. about education. Well, as a venture capitalist, of course, Dr. Lee is passionate about AI, but as a journalist, I need to look past the novel and lighthearted games AI and humans have played and ask him some fundamental questions related to our future with this technology. It seems that Dr. Lee also agrees that we'd better see the big picture. For games, uh, there's uh, the, the best people in the world cannot be the AI. Mm. But I think it's time to move on to the real business applications where there's a, a direct business value that's being created. Mm -hmm. So in financial applications, in uh, robotic applications, in medical applications, I think AI is going to blossom and create a lot of value. And, and that's what we should really focus on. Uh, in the next 10 to 15 years, it should easily replace 50% of human uh, jobs and human That's exactly effort. what I want to follow up with. I yeah. know you are much more into science than I am, which is liberal arts, but uh -huh. still you have to help us understand where yeah. does your number come from, 50% of the job, because you've been talking about this yeah. all over the world. Okay, so Oxford University did a study mm. over the 7,000 job categories in the world, and, and they, they did an extrapolation of to what degree AI can replace those jobs, and they decomposed the jobs into parts of the jobs. So for example, loan officer is one example, someone who determines to lend the money to you or not. Right. An assistant will have many components, uh, a receptionist uh, and um, accountant, a paralegal, a reporter. So they took many components of those jobs and they aggregated what percentage of those jobs are repetitive, are possible to collect big data, and it's possible for the big data driven AI to be better than person. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the cognitive part of replacing humans, right? It goes all the way from the jobs I mentioned all the way up to radiologists, right. uh, which could be partially replaced. And then they did uh, a percentage of people whose jobs or percentages of whose jobs could be re replaced. So it has real numerical basis. And then there is the manual labor replacement, which is actually probably a little bit larger than the um, cognitive uh, replacement. Give me some examples. So driver, yes. factory floor worker, construction worker, uh, repairman uh, are the manual labor that uh, are projected to be replaced. Uh, the first ones will actually be probably be uh, assembly line factory worker, right? People who are stationary in nature and just putting things together, not very skilled. Mm -hmm. uh, the second type would be the construction worker. On the internet, you can see um, robots that lay bricks much better than people. So it's not every type of construction, maybe the ones that require modest level of right. uh, dexterity. Uh, and then you go on to um, drivers. Right? Drivers alone are close to 10% of the world's population. So when autonomous vehicle takes off, basically all the drivers will be, be replaced. So that's where the 50% come from? So they're adding up, yeah, a few percent at a time, uh, total about 50%. The reason to be optimistic is that each such AI replacing a human is creating a huge economic value mm -hmm. and technological progress. And I think very few governments and corporations can resist the temptation 
to let its technology race ahead mm. and, uh, and to reap the reward from the economic value being created. But come on, careful. I mean, you were in AI research back yeah. in the 1980s, beginning right. from that period of time. Yep. You've seen these ups and downs, and people are excited, mm -hmm. overexcited, and mm -hmm. then uh, over uh, pessimistic about mm -hmm. the whole thing. And this, again, this yeah. time, is it yesterday once more? Uh, I don't think so. No, Be not really? Because back in my PhD days, the algorithms were not nearly good enough. Mm -hmm. The amount of data we have was not nearly good enough. The computers were not fast enough. And, uh, and also, as a result, I and my colleagues never made such projections, right? <laughs> so this is the first time Okay, that, I can uh, testify to that. Yeah, that's right, right. You've <laughs> interviewed me. This is the very me. first time. That's right. The first time we're making those projections. On the mm. one hand, we all know, quote unquote, this wolf mm. can be good, can be bad mm -hmm. in different ways. Right. It's coming. Yeah. And yet, we are not really preparing for it. What do we do about the replaced, displaced people? What do we do about um, education? Uh, and uh, how do we uh, uh, narrow the gap between the haves and have nots? Mm. How do we prevent the successful AI companies from becoming too powerful and too rich? Whose job is it to think about all these questions you just raised? <sighs> is that your job, Kai Fu? I think all of us have to mm. play our part. So innovation Ventures, yeah. the thing that you're doing, has a lot right. to do with the future development of technology. So you're certainly coming at it from a business and venture capitalist perspective. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you from that perspective. Okay. Will there be too much concentration of data, mm. too much concentration of access to data mm -hmm. and privacy and information mm -hmm. from the business? Well, the businesses that have a lot of data will gather even more data. I'd, I, I'd like to think they're behaving reasonably, but I think the best way to check, uh, to provide checks and balances for them is to encourage much greater uh, competition to have, you know, a hundred or a thousand companies like them mm. competing for users with them and providing solutions with them and each with its access to a certain amount of data but not giving any one company But these are much. unicorns. I mean, it's very hard to rival against them because they have enjoyed quite a golden period of time mm -hmm. over the other future competitors. Is it ever possible to create this competition? You said yourself five to ten years. Is it ever possible? Well, the worst case is that uh, they may become dominant and mm -hmm. then antitrust laws may have to come in to check them. The other thing is the access to information for the public to understand mm. about the technologies. Yeah. Well, first, I don't personally own any of your information. <laughs> I'm not by do or Tencent. No. Um, but um, I, I think users do need a certain degree of uh, knowledge as to how much privacy they're giving away for convenience. Mm. I mean, the, the game today that is being played is these internet giants are taking all of your privacy information mm. and hopefully keep, keeping it uh, 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 from give, getting out. And I think they're doing a decent job at it. Mm. We don't read about too many leakages. And they're providing you great convenience, right? So when you go on Taobao, the things you see are things you actually want to buy. When you go on uh, Tencent, you have a ease of interacting with your uh, network of friends. So it's currently the current model that's working in China, U.S., and anywhere is a model of implied trust yes. where I, as a user, give up my private information to the giant internet giants, and in exchange, I get convenience, and so far, they haven't um, done anything to lose my trust. That is a fragile balance, and, mm -hmm. and I hope there are more uh, laws and media and checks and balances and competition that will keep it that way. But you know, Kaifu, the question really should be, how can we let AI to work with us? Yes, that's a very good point too. As an assistance, yeah. as a tool, yeah. rather than let it dominate what we will already have and right. what we will have in the future. How much have yeah. effort been put into that category? I think there are some big opportunities there. But I, about them. I don't want to be too optimistic <laughs> because AI will uh, improve rapidly with more data. So let's take doctors. Let's take um, cancer diagnosis as an example, mm. right? Um, let's say a doctor for a particular type of, let's say, lung cancer can uh, 
properly identify and save, let's say, hypothetically, 70 out of 100 patients. Right. Okay? And let's say the first AI tool that comes out probably won't be that good. Maybe it will save uh, 50. But the doctor using that tool together maybe can save uh, 73. So that's three more persons saved thanks to the tool. Mm -hmm. But if we move time forward another five years, that same tool or a better tool with more data may be able to save 80 lives. That's right. Now the doctor has to work hard to together working with the tool save maybe 83. So that three extra lives is the value the doctor has to add. Mm -hmm. But I think I have to be realistic on this show and tell you if, if, it can, if the AI tool can go from 50 to 80, it will probably go to 90, 95, and 99. At some point, the human cannot add any more value. Mm -hmm. It's going to be like, okay, I can, uh, you know, I can spend uh, five years and maybe save one more life. The marginal benefit of the user will be diminishing because the AI tool will get so good with more data. Mm -hmm. That might be 30 years away, but that day will come. So I think the, the simple one plus one equals three t human machine symbiotic do better quantitatively is a optimistic scenario for the long term. Not mm -hmm. probably not going to be ha happening. However, but I do think the following scenario will be realistic. What is it? The doctor will be more of a human to human um, compassion um, connector. So the tool will largely be good enough and the human cannot do a better job in terms of the diagnosis. Right. But maybe the tool will say, will come out with specific numbers. Do these tests, after the test, determine uh, here is a fourth stage lymphoma with a 70% chance of dying in five years, right. within five years. But the doctor won't be the code pronouncer of that death sentence to the, to the patient. The doctor instead will talk to the patient and say, well, you know, there's this guy, Kai Fu Li, he had the same kind of lymphoma. He fought it. He took this chemotherapy. And that's what I'm going to prescribe for you. I think if you keep up, you should have a shot just like he did, hmm. right? That kind of giver of confidence, listening to the patient, maybe visiting the patient at home, hmm. always taking a call when the patient calls, which our doctors currently probably cannot do, uh, will actually create more doctor's jobs than there are today. Hmm. But the job is different. It's not an end-to-end -end diagnosis and human interface. It's just the interface. But what if? There is always a what if. Yeah. As things change, as you said, it is quantitative, and yet things could change dramatically once it reached a certain level. So what if AI takes on life of its own? Is right. there a possibility? Uh, you have to ask that question, the dysto <laughs> dystopia question. Uh, one cannot rule out that possibility. Uh, but one and one can, cannot rule out whether AI could in the future develop its own emotions. Uh, one cannot rule that out. Yeah. But we also can't rule out that one day we could fly or rule out that, you know, we couldn't. Uh, yeah, uh, biological warfare destroys mankind. Anything is possible. This is possible. But it's not possible to extrapolate from the engineering algorithms today mm. to say, oh, I'll develop it and one day that will happen. In my mind, I can see engineering algorithms improving cancer detection, diagnosis, right. and um, um, uh, improving to a level way beyond human in the next 20, 30 years. I think it's almost a certainty. Uh, I can just imagine the types of um, algorithms that we already have, plus more data, plus more algorithms, and so on, with no breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. um, but the emotion, the love, the self-replication, uh, taking a mind of its own, right. self-awareness, control human, that's all still just in our imagination. It's not based on any solid scientific uh, evidence. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's possible, but it's, uh, it's, there's, it's, there's no way to connect the dots at this point. Mm. So I would probably delay that debate and focus more on the real problems of em employment and education, things right. like that. But you see, Kai Fu, with your experience in the tech world, mm -hmm. you see a trend of new technologies being applied for 20 or 30 years before another new trend comes in and mm. takes its place. Yeah. Earlier we have the social media, which is still going on right now. We right. are using the best benefits of it. Yeah. Uh, and well, at the same time, AI is already coming. Right. So one would argue 
you know, even if there is AI, whether we will be able to develop its full potential mm -hmm. to what extent before the next trend takes its place mm -hmm. is an interesting question, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think there will be multiple trends and they will happen at the same time faster than ever before. Exactly, I because think, of AI. Uh, and related to it, mm -hmm. and not, uh, not only because of it. For example, I think virtual reality, augmented yes. reality, uh, Internet of Things, mm. wearable computing, uh, those things will all emerge and they'll be related to AI but a little bit different, but they'll reinforce each other. Right. So we're going to be really see this, be seeing multiple tech revolutions hitting us simultaneously mm. and mutually reinforcing. This will be, you know, in the next 10 years, it'll be more than the entire, you know, human history. That's true. What about for you, finally? I mean, all of this exciting development, while you are being an advocate of AI, you even write a book recently about it, yes. and talking about it all over the world, you're being quoted widely. There's a lot of danger in that, uh, <laughs> in I terms guess. of, uh, are you betting on the right thing? Yeah, well, I, I'm actually generally pretty cautious <laughs> and pretty accurate. So if you go back at my track record, I think it's pretty decent. You know, I predicted the um, mobile phones and Android in, in uh, 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2011, on the, on the worldwide media, I predicted that Chinese people will stop paying cash and start using their phones, mm -hmm. even though there wasn't even WeChat. So I think there's good reasons to uh, listen to me when I make a prediction. <laughs> I will listen to you, Kai Fu, and looking forward to future discussions with you about all the latest developments. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Kai Fu. Thank you. All the best. Thanks.